It has been 25 years since the assassination, some say the execution, of Benigno Aquino Jr. After the celebrated fact-finding investigation by the Agrava Commission that yielded two sets of findings in 1984 and two Sandigan Bayan trials that came to opposite conclusions in 1985 and 1990, plus a number of belated and unconfirmed revelations, many questions remain unanswered. First, will we ever know with absolute certainty who masterminded the assassination? More to the point, were the principal plotters able to get away with murder? How long can they remain scot-free with their lives and interests intact while those who merely follow their orders wallow in jail? Will justice ever be truly served for Ninoy and for the Filipino nation? Do Filipinos still care to know the truth or is the Aquino assassination another dreary episode in their history that they would much rather forget? The news of Ninoy's impending return in 1983 did not sit well with those who lapped it up during the martial law years. With Marcos ill and with no clear line of succession, a number of key cronies and power blocks, as well as politicized factions of the military, stood at risk in the event of the charismatic Aquino's accession to the presidency. This explains why Ninoy received repeated warnings that his life could be at risk should he decide to come home. It could also be argued that the Communist Party of the Philippines and the New People's Army had much to lose from an Aquino comeback. Years of building a formidable mass base in the countryside could be undone by the rise of a charismatic leader from the ranks of the moderates. Indeed, up to the very end, the government would stick to its contention that a lone gunman had been hired by the communists to assassinate Senator Aquino. A quick scan of plausible suspects in the murder case seems to present a complex maze of possibilities. But as in any investigation of a crime of this magnitude, the process is greatly simplified by asking three basic questions. The first has to do with motive and gain. Why was Ninoy killed and who stood to benefit most from his death? The second question pertains to the practical ability to commit the crime who had the means and best opportunity to carry out the assassination. And the third question springs from the obvious attempts to conceal the true nature of the crime. Who had the power to cover up what actually happened at the tarmac on August 21, 1983? The question of motive and gain narrows the field of plausible suspects to a handful. On top of the list would be Ferdinand Marcos himself. After all, he had been the most powerful man in the Philippines for close to 20 years and had accumulated hidden wealth estimated conservatively at 5 to 10 billion U.S. dollars. Next on the list would be his wife Imelda and the Romualdas family who needed to preserve the fortune they gained from the newspaper, power distribution, container terminal, and gambling industries. Both Marcoses commanded the loyalty of General Ver, who himself accumulated considerable assets in the United States out of his gains from, among others, the illicit operations of the so-called Binondo Central Bank. Among the key cronies, by far the most powerful was Dandinko Huanco, who controlled the lucrative coconut monopoly and San Miguel Corporation, the most coveted Philippine company. According to Ricardo Manapat, the value of Cojuanco's assets at one point reached one-fourth of the Philippines' GNP. Wala akong inutang sa labas ng bansang ito na ginarantiyan ng pamahalan ito. As the most trusted crony, Danding was reportedly made part of the executive committee designated to take over the country upon Marcos's death. Wala akong kontrata sa gobyerno na masama para sa ating mga kababayan. Kowanko also held the rank of reserve colonel in the Philippine Air Force, mother unit of the Aviation Security Command or AVSICOM, which was assigned to secure Ninoy upon his arrival. At ang... Uh, 
Nahirapan ay ating taong bayan. He reputedly had a private army trained by the Israeli military as well as close ties with several high-ranking Philippine military officers. For a long while, Kowanko ruled the Coconut Empire in tandem with Defense Minister Juan Ponce Enrile, who had his own interests in the lumber and wood industry, among others. Enrile was gradually eased out of the coconut monopoly, especially after the creation of the United Coconut Planters Bank in 1982. He was similarly marginalized from military power bases, with General Ve reporting directly to Marcos. Because orders would be given straight from General Ver to the field units, bypassing the traditional chain of command in his capacity as uh, Chief of Staff of the Armed Forces and uh, also Commander of the Regional Unified Commands. And since he was based in Malacanang, sitting beside the President as a Presidential Security Group or Security command, Commander, uh, even the departments or ministries were being bypassed. So uh, you can see the uh, gathering of uh, the levers of power in the hands of one uh, general officer. Examining the means and the opportunity to commit a crime compels us to revisit the forensic evidence and the scene of the assassination. Was it even remotely possible for a lone hitman hired by the communists to have shot Ninoy at the airport tarmac as Marcos and the military claimed. Based on the evidence, this scenario does not seem plausible. An immediately observable fact was the presence of more than a thousand soldiers at the Manila International Airport on August 21, 1983. It was evident that the military was prepared for Ninoy's homecoming. In fact, the armed forces had a detailed operational plan, ostensibly to protect the former senator. Called Oplan Balikbayan, it was conceived based on a letter sent by former Senator Salvador Laurel to then-General Fidel Ramos. It was AVSECOM Chief General Luther Custodio who prepared Oplan Balikbayan upon the instructions of General Ver. Oplan Balikbayan had four implementing plans that covered all aspects of Ninoy's arrival. Foremost among these was Implan Alalay, which designated a boarding party composed of Lieutenant Jesus Castro, Sergeant Arnulfo de Mesa, Sergeant Claro Lat, Constable Mario Lazaga, and Constable Rogelio Moreno. Their task, supposedly, was to fetch Senator Aquino from the plane cabin and to turn him over to Captain Felipe Valerio, who would take Ninoy to Fort Bonifacio on board an AVSICOM van. So, Oakland Balikbayan was, in fact, a protective plan? Supposed to be a protective plan. Unfortunately, it was not to be. And if there were no intention to... to to kill Ninoy, 1,000 1, 000 men could have prevented the assassination. Plan Alpha called for the boarding party exiting with Senator Aquino through the tube to a remote holding room and on to the van. However, upon last-minute instructions from General Custodio, what was carried out was Plan Bravo, which called for exiting through the bridge stairs to the AVSICOM van. The whole scene had been carefully sanitized and orchestrated to obstruct public view of what was to transpire at the bridge stairway. But the plotters did not reckon that a handful of courageous eyewitnesses would surface just the same. The most celebrated of these eyewitnesses was the so-called crying lady, Rebecca Quijano. Maraming reporters na mga sumalubong Tinatanong nila ako na bakit daw ako umiiyak. Sinabi ko sa kanila na pinatay nila si Ninoy, bakit hindi kayo umiiyak? Hmm. 
nung bumaba na, nagbukas ng pintuan, may pumasok na tatlong sundalo na sabi niya, Senator, pinaiim, parang something pinaiimbita. Pinaiimbitaan kayo dito? Ako? Sa tayo pumunta? Nung tumayo siya, nagsunudan ngayon lang yung mga reporters. So, yung ginawa ko, ginawa ko yung camera ko. Sumunod din ako para mag-pretend na, na reporter para makasama nga ako. So, yung pagdating namin doon sa may pintuan ng, ng airplane, bigla kaming, yung mga nakabarong, bigla kaming hinarang. So, when they closed the door, uh, tumakbo ako doon sa first class, sa right side, yung sa may window. So, doon, doon ay, doon ko, I had a, may chance ako, na, nakita ko yung, yung hamdanan doon, going to the, Karma. Ano yung nakita mo? Nagsilip mo doon sa bintana? Nung pababa na si Ninoy kasama yung tatlong sindalo. Pababa na mga few steps hanggang tarmac. Yun naman yung nakita kong binaril siya nung sa likod niya. Na I guess ang pangalan niya is Moreno. Kihano's testimony was corroborated by a number of airport personnel who witnessed the murder from different vantage points. Ramon Balang, a ground engineer of Philippine Airlines, had just completed his visual check of the China Airlines plane. On his way to a concrete post to get his worksheet, he noticed people going down the bridge stairs. He then heard a shot, looked toward the stairs, and saw Senator Aquino's body falling toward the tarmac. At almost the same instant, he noticed a man in blue at the rear of the van being surrounded by about three or four men in navy blue coveralls. He was smiling and talking animatedly with the soldiers. The man in blue fell on his back after a burst of gunfire. With the soldiers aiming their guns in all directions, Balang hurriedly ran for cover. Another PAL employee, Jesse Barcelona, was tasked with servicing the equipment of incoming planes. Upon reaching an area between Bay 9 and Bay 5 to get a towing tractor, he recognized Colonel Rolando Abadilla, a known Marcos henchman, talking with a man clad in a light blue PAL shirt and maong pants. Aboard the tow tractor, Jesse headed toward Bay 8 and noticed 15 meters away a man in white flanked by two soldiers in the middle of the bridge stair. In the next instant, he saw another soldier pointing a gun at the nape of the man in white and firing a shot. The man in white lurched forward onto the tarmac as his escorts and the gunman ran away. At this precise moment, Barcelona saw the man with whom Colonel Abadilla had been conversing earlier about to fall near the man in white. Beside him was a soldier holding a gun. Further corroborating testimony was provided by Olivia Reyes Antimano of the Lanting Security and Watchman Agency. These eyewitness accounts dismantled the military fiction that a man in blue, later identified as Rolando Galman, had darted from behind the metal stairway, breached the security cordon, and shot Senator Aquino at the tarmac with a 357 Magnum revolver. When one of the escorts, Sergeant de Mesa, supposedly caused Galman to drop his weapon, it was then that an AVSECOM soldier emerged from the van and shot Galman. However, by sequencing 150 photographs taken that day at the tarmac, the Agrava board in its majority report was able to conclude that the military's version of events was clearly and definitely a concocted, confabulated story and that Rolando Galman was not the assassin of Senator Aquino. The, the photochronology as assembled and constituted 
was a, a very accurate, very reliable guide in the assessment and analysis of the rest of the evidence. Because those, those photographs certainly did not lie. Which leads you to the inevitable conclusion that it was a military conspiracy. The single most important piece of evidence based on the autopsy of the slain senator's body lent credence to the accounts that the fatal shot had been fired at the stairway where only soldiers could have been. The most important evidence is the evidence depicting the trajectory of the, of the bullet when it hit the head of uh, Senator Aquino. The trajectory was fo forward, downward, medially. It could have been very awkward for somebody on the ground to shoot another person, raising his arm and aiming his gun in a very awkward fashion like this and try to hit this part of the skull. So, I could not connect somebody from the ground shooting Aquino. And so, where, where the trajectory was downward, it only means that the assailant was above the, the victim. In addition, Japanese sound expert Dr. Matsumi Suzuki testified that the sound of the first gunshot heard on the service stairs was closer to that of a 45 caliber pistol. 0.357 bullet could have shattered the whole head. Digging into the background of Rolando Galman, the supposed communist hired hitman, it became even more apparent that the whole plot had been, at the very least, a military conspiracy. Well, there was no evidence to link uh, Galman as a communist. And of course, I uh, said, the evidence did not show that he was the, the Ghana. In the past few years, Rolando Galman, later on, the other people I know, he was the only one who was the only one who was the gun for her in Nueva Ecija. Pero nung pinakilala sa akin ni General Custodio, sabi niya, ito, sabi niya, talagang si Jun, sabi niya, ito ang kasama mo. A 33-year-old ex-convict from Bagong Silang, San Miguel, Bulacan, Galman had been jailed for armed robbery and other crimes, but after his release had been employed as a military asset. Ang tatay ko kasi mga kaibigan niya, military. So, yun ang naan niya sa akin. There's a reason why na meron siyang mga barrel. The records of the Agrava Fact-Finding Commission showed that Air Force Colonel Arturo Custodio and businessman Hermilo Gosuico picked up Galman from his house on August 17, 1983. Usual na mga pangyayari yung mga ganon. Na darating sila, isasama nila ang father ko. So, hindi na ano sa amin, hindi na bago. Uh, si Colonel Custodio kasi, is, alam ko na friend siya ng tatay ko. Kapag may mga occasion sa place niya, pupunta kami. Ganun. Kapag sa amin may mga occasion, sila naman na pupunta. In its majority report, the Agrava Fact-Finding Board again clearly stated that Colonel Custodio is the link between Galman and the AVSICOM. The AVSICOM's involvement in the plot was further corroborated in 1995 by Master Sergeant Pablo Martinez when he revealed that he was tasked by Colonel Romeo Ochoco, then AVSICOM Deputy Commander, retired General Romeo Gatan of the Constabulary, and Goswiko to escort Galman from a hotel near the airport to the tarmac to await the arrival of Ninoy from Taipei. According to Martinez, he and Galman were briefed on the assassination plot by Gatan, Ochoco, and Goswiko at the Carlston Hotel on August 20, 1983. 
It was on this occasion that Ochoco gave Galman a 357 Magnum revolver. Martinez said that two of these three men were associated with businessman Danding Cojuanco. But there was evidence really that Galman was held in comunicado at the Carlston Hotel together with his girlfriend. Martinez added that in the morning of August 21, two female friends of Galman, Ana Oliva and her sister Catherine, joined them for breakfast at the hotel. Several days after the assassination, the two women were reported missing. The remains were exhumed from a sugarcane field in Capas Tarlac in 1988. Similarly, Galman's wife, Lina Lazaro, disappeared after she was abducted from her house on January 29, 1984. Taken together, the bits and pieces of evidence and sworn testimonies overwhelmingly confirm the connivance and control of elements of the military in the plot to kill Ninoy Aquino. The question is, did ultimate culpability rest in the hands of a few generals and colonels, and at most with General Vare? Or must the guilt be traced higher up the chain of command? Just two or three people in Malacanang knew of the real plot. <laughs>